Satine Phoenix and Jameson Stone drop in on the podcast today. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. Now, guys, I have an incredible interview today, which is coming right up. But first, if you are struggling running your games and you are spending too much time in prep or you're canceling your game sessions because your work and family obligations are cutting into your DM prep time, I have a solution for you. I write the books of random tables. Those help you cut down your prep time. You can find those at Amazon.com, DriveThroughRPG.com, and my own website, DiceGeeks.com. I have books for fantasy, modern, post-apocalyptic, science fiction, cyberpunk, Wild West, and more that will help you cut down your prep time and have more fun at the table. So like I said... You can go to Amazon, drive through RPG, DiceGeeks.com, or you can simply just type in the book of random tables in Google and you will find my books. Now, it is time for today's exciting interview. It is my pleasure to welcome two guests to the podcast today. They are the masterminds behind Sirens, Battle of the Bards, which is currently on Kickstarter right now. My first guest is D&D Luminary and game designer Satine Phoenix. And my other guest is Apotheosis Studio CEO, Jameson Stone. Satine and Jameson, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, no problem. It's my pleasure. Satine, how were you introduced to Dungeons and Dragons? I was eight years old. We had a really, really creepy basement. We had dirt floors. In the back of the basement was a treasure chest in the shape of a U-Haul box. Deep within this box was a red box. And inside of this red box was a world of rules and dice. And I found this box in our old gaming box and just fell in love. I'm obsessed with books. I don't know if you can see behind us, but... Uh, we're both collectors. Um, I grew up in libraries, so it was just a natural thing to fall in love with this game. And so I started playing when I was eight by myself. And then finally, and this is like, I played by myself a lot. And um, finally in high school, I found that my drama club people played there. And when I found out, I was like, I am playing with you. And they said, okay, fine. Yeah. And it's been um, amazing ever since. Awesome. Awesome. I was nine when I played the first time. So that's great. That mm-hmm. is great. How about you, Jameson? Man, so the, the first experience I had with TTRPGs was actually through LARPing. Um, I had a babysitter who had the coolest boyfriend ever, and he was uh, <laughs> b- uh, big into LARPing. And so he would bring over his you know form- foam swords and, and shields and helmets and armor. And, um, I, I remember um, looking up, his name was Dylan. I remember looking up to Dylan. I just, I thought he was like a god, uh, you know, a god among among humans and <clears throat> he introduced me um to yeah just um uh, ttrpgs in, ttrpgs in general it was so fantastic uh, to be able to really like embody that power as a kid you know and wielding these you know foam swords and bashing each other and then he transitioned into the actual tabletop but uh, he he knew that he kind of needed to to kind of lure me into the game by having me actually like actually fight um i was a martial artist at the time and so to be able to then do it and then transition being a spellcaster was fantastic and so as i then um, got a little bit older into junior high i played a lot of uh, mage of the ascension um played a lot of vampire the masquerade and shadow run um and then in college played even more and then eventually opened up apotheosis studios where we're able to make games and share them with fellow gamers Oh, that's awesome. And th- th- that does sound like the coolest uh, babysitter's boyfriend ever. It was, it was, that is. It was, it was 
so much fun. I knew I knew that he was enjoying it too, and I, I looked up to them both so much. It was just it was such a great introduction into into gaming. Because I've been playing video games since I could probably walk. I mean, I, I love video games. That's fantastic. But there's just something about TTRPGs um, that is so much is so much more magical to be able to connect with others while doing it. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. I, I will never forget that. Yeah, her name was Joy, and his name was Dylan. It was just some of Aww. my yeah some of my my, my <laughs> most fond childhood memories. All right. That's that's awesome. So, Satine, you said it kind of just captured your imagination. Was it uh, the characters, the storytelling? What was it that kind of really got it for I, you? I love fantasy. If it has anything to do with elves and dragons, like that's my jam right there. Swords. Um, um, in my house, uh, my, my dad traveled the world and collected things from different cultures. And one of his favorite things that was all over our house were Frazetta paintings. So I, that was ingrained into my brain. So, you know, giant snakes attacking barbarians, like that was my jam. And um, yeah, so I really liked the fantasticalness that there was this realm that you could go to that was nothing like the real world. Uh, a lot of escapism from really young. So I, in like second grade, I was reading at like a sixth grade level and they like put me ahead in school because my grandmother lived next door to a library. And so I literally grew up in a library and that's the playpen that I had. And she would write fantasy stories and I would draw them. So even at like three and four years old, I was just always enamored. Then you had, you know, I'm an 80s baby, 1980. So we had Labyrinth, Legend, Dark Crystal, and, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon. And I watched all of them. We were definitely tv files So that, it was an easy uh, progression to, you know, find this and like, oh, I can be all these characters, you know, and my parents were mad at me. I would ride my bike to the library and check out fantasy novels and just lock myself in the bedroom. My mom would yell at me why aren't you out here doing something else like cleaning? I was like, I'm reading. Leave me alone. Stop uh, reading. I would get in trouble for reading too. <laughs> yeah. It was like, like straight out of Matilda. My, my mom and, and her wife, they would be watching TV and they'd be like, why don't you watch TV with us? I'm like, I'm literally reading a book, like sitting on my bed. Like, I, was like, I was like, this is so cliche. Like, am I Matilda? Like seriously? I think it even happened one time when they were actually watching the movie Matilda. And I was like, are you, is this a joke? <laughs> like I'm reading a book. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Other people try to get their kids to read. Why are you why are you asking me to stop? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always thought that was interesting about Dungeons and Dragons as well, because um, I, I guess I'm a little older than you are, Satine. So uh, um, but I loved all those movies and stuff as well. But uh, dun getting into Dungeons and Dragons found me in my uh, found me in my bedroom doing uh, math problems and reading books. And uh, you. you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like no downside I, and, and, and you're like hanging out with your friends. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. yeah. Cooperative, cooperative. I would get in trouble because I would have slumber parties at my friends' houses that were not girls, but it was a bunch of dudes and me and their mom playing Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> so that's always <laughs> weird. You know, you're like, no, but we're actually not doing anything. But it sounds weird, but we're not actually doing anything so weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. It's like, uh, what did you do when you were a teenager? I, uh, me and my friends stayed in our bedroom and we did math problems, read books and tried to figure out, you know, um, how to, how our Rangers could cast spells or, or whatever it was we were doing right. at that time. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. Um, we, we live dangerously for pretend, I guess, I guess yeah. you could say that, exactly. but now kids do yes. that. This is how kids interact. Sure. Like almost four year old now. And it's so easy to communicate with her because she's so imaginative, you know, and then watching adults forget about that part of them. We all started there. There's like very little reason for us not to have held on to our imaginations. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more with that. Like I said, I was nine years old and it was like Dungeons and Dragons was made for, you know, for like that age. Right. Like I just immediately 
just started trying to do whatever I could in Dungeons and Dragons. Like I didn't know any of the rules, but the next day I ran my mom through a dungeon, right? That's what, that's what I did because I didn't know, I didn't know that like, you know, being the dungeon master was like a big deal. I just, I was just like, Hey, let's, I want to play this game. Right. And I couldn't, I couldn't hold it in anymore. And it was, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. So uh, yeah. So it, it is interesting to hear those stories. I, I always enjoy hearing Kind of everybody's uh, origin story there when they discovered D anD D, but now uh, Satine, um, it just didn't stay a hobby for you, right? You began streaming and, of course, uh, game designing. How, how did how did that come about? Yeah, um, I left America and went to live in Australia, and I didn't drink. And I didn't know how to make friends that wasn't at a bar or something. So my ex and I we went to a game store. And this is back when meetup.com first started. And that was really interesting. Like, okay, here are other adults. But I had taken a little hiatus off of uh, gaming after college. So for only like two, three years, I took a break. We get there and like, oh, this is cool. And I come back to America and tell my friends. And my friends are like, let's do this as a web series. And I was like, okay, sure. So we had a web series called I Hit It With My Axe. And it was very novel and uh, it was a big hit. Well, it was a big hit for some people. And well, some people, they didn't like it at all because there's a bunch of girls playing Dungeons and Dragons. So that was 2008. And by 2010, I was running the Hollywood gaming community at Meltdown Comics. And uh, yeah, it, it just was this thing that happened. Suddenly, I was, uh, I, I thought to myself, had a major career change. Like, what, what made me happy as a kid? Dungeons and Dragons and charity. So I, I was in a youth group from 11 to 18 that all we did was raise money for charities. And so it was a really beautiful, really positive, really uplifting, and it was community driven, community based. It's like, okay, I want to do that too. And I want to do that as a 30 year old woman. So I started Celebrity Charity 20 with Keith Baker, and he would write the adventure and then we'd run them. We had this crazy idea. What if you could play a game? record it via audio and camera and put it on a website (laughs) so the celebrities on there could have their fans and friends donate to this charity (laughs) crazy idea so this is 2010 nobody had been live streaming yet yeah before live streaming was a thing at all well um in so a lot of things happened at meltdown comics it was um nerdist came out of meltdown comics that was a podcast by chris hardwick up this it's a massive uh venue so up top was that and then dan Harmon was doing theater in the back um and in this other building they purchased after i started hanging out there uh it was justin tv which i think is where twitch came yep. from yeah that's the precursor yeah yeah the, yeah. Pre- pre- the precursor for, to twitch yeah so that was in the other room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is yeah, like, so you've got Nerdist, Rick and Morty, yeah. and Twitch, and Zatine Phoenix yeah, all coming out of meltdown. All came out of meltdown. <clears throat> and it was pretty amazing. Um, it was easy, and and so I would do that twice a week, and I did their life drawing events there because I also taught art, and it was this hub. It was an amazing hub, and back then, not many women were coming out that they were playing. Not not that they didn't play, but that they just wouldn't say, oh, I played Dungeons and Dragons. And for those, many of them wanted to, but didn't have a safe place to. So my favorite comment, and also my, the saddest comment was, I've always wanted to play, but my brother wouldn't let me, or I, they let me, but they killed my character. My boyfriend wouldn't let me, or if they did, they killed my character, <laughs> you know? Um, so that was really interesting. And I just did that year after year. It's how I met Matt Mercer. He was involved in that. Marisha Tallison, uh, they all started in that, in that he was running a home game at the time, Jason Charles Miller. It's a lot of really cool people that you see now streaming that started doing stuff there and, you know, watching them take it, their own version of it and go off and, and do like Jason Charles Miller's now making music every Tuesday with Idol Champions. Yeah. Matt and Marisha did very well with, you know, with Peak and Sundry. And it it was really cool to have that. And even like the first two years were terrible. We actually had four game tables in the same room and on the same web page. And it was just the most chaotic, weird thing. The second year was awful. And then the third year, that was 2013, 
Then we started establishing it a little bit better. Now we've got like a look, we have it on different web pages, and now it's starting to look like something. And honestly, it hasn't changed much since then, except for the fact that, you know, oftentimes your, your head in boxes now with virtual gaming. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. Okay. No, that's awesome. And thank you for, you know, kind of walking us through that. That was really cool. Uh, Jameson, could you kind of tell us what is Apotheosis Studios? I introduced you as the CEO. So why don't you tell us a little about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for me, some of my uh, kind of what the team was touching on uh, a lot of a lot of my childhood I enjoyed fantasy and science fiction uh, for escapism and it just was a great way um, to be able to I think find some of the justice that was lacking in my life we could kind of live it vicariously um, you know at, at, at the gaming table and so um, then as you know as I got older and um, I kind of started um, becoming a professional writer and really understanding well, what are the things that I love writing. Um, I did a lot of ghost writing, um, a lot of writing in, in higher academia, um, but always came back to writing um, uh, science fiction fantasy. Um, uh, published uh, my first novel called The Apprentice and then published a graphic novel called The Last Amazon. But I still always came back and, and gravitated back towards games and gaming. Um, and so um, really just love being able to craft a story that you can not just share and kind of put on a table and a person you kind of consumes, but co-create with someone and create the world and the foundation and the framework that a game master and players can use to, to co-create and, and co-experience um, that world together and, and, and actually build the Kind of the, the the unification among each other as a party, um, and so um, decided to, to to make a company out of it. So Apotheosis Studios, um, we are just game designers, um, and we uh, design for a couple different uh, platforms, and um, really appreciate fifth edition. So obviously, you know the Dungeons and Dragons rule set, um, and through OGL are allowed to create independent works um, within fifth edition, which is fantastic. Um, and it started just as myself, um, as a published novelist saying, hey, um, you know, I, I know that a single person, I can write a novel and get it published if I work really hard, right? And, and, and taking feedback. Um, I, I, I know I'm smart enough to do that. Um, and so I did, and it was great. And then um, I was like, okay, now I'm gonna build my team. I wanna do a graphic novel, I need to have an illustrator. And so I, I started working with David Granjo, uh, who is still, he's now our art director of the company. Um, and we made a you know fantastic graphic novel, put it up on Kickstarter, and we raised enough money for the print run. Um, and I was like, okay, now we're gonna start growing the team. And each project sort of bring more people on board. And, you know, literally like, you know, 14, 15 years ago, started just myself when I was working another job doing a lot of ghostwriting and editing. Um, and now we have nearly eight full-time employees um, and we hope to continue growing and making more content for everybody. So yeah, we, uh, we just love making games and love sharing them with, with fellow gamers. Oh, that is awesome. That is so cool to hear. Um, uh, I know this, the, Obviously, you know, streaming and all of that has caused tabletop role playing games and Dungeons and Dragons to explode. And um, I am I am so happy about that because there there was a time in high school when I walked around forlornly with my book looking for somebody to play. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, think I, I read my campaign. But sadly, I read my campaign books more than I was able to actually play them because mm -hmm. it really was not cool to be a gamer. And I remember I had a lot of friends. And I so I did martial arts, and, you know, I, you know, I, I was athletic, but I wanted to, I wanted to play. I, I just yeah. really wanted to play with people. Um, and now, it, like, it seems like the entire culture has shifted, which is so fantastic to see, you know, that, that a lot of the gatekeeping isn't there anymore, and that mm -hmm. it is now cool to be creative and imaginative with your friends. So I tell you, it's not been easy. This is like, there are a handful of us who've been working our asses off over the last eight years to make this an acceptable hobby you know i've been going to these gaming conventions where people would look at me like i should just walk out the door as of five years ago four years ago that's not the case I'm welcomed and embraced but that's because of myself and people like me who we basically said no we are not going to be gate kept out of something that we are in love with as much as you're in love with it yeah. you know and so it has changed because we forced it to change and by force we just decided to do it and not be afraid to do it yeah un un unapologetically unapologetically yeah. yeah 
Yeah, and now you see people like I guess Jeff Goldblum is going to be on a podcast, and yeah, he's actually people on. I love, I love, I love the D and D Five E Facebook group. They are so much fun. They're like they're kind of like my game store. I, I go in there and read everybody's stuff. Somebody started um, saying something sassy about Jeff Goldblum playing this, and it was you know famous people are playing Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, bird, 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 and I was like. Well, actually, and I even put raise his hand slowly. Um, he's actually in my friend's LARP in Los Angeles. He's a gamer. He plays, yeah. Yeah. you know, and you, we should be welcoming to new players. Yeah. Just because they're famous doesn't mean that they're not into games. What they are afraid of is that they're afraid of people ridiculing them. They're afraid of people saying, this is mine. You're not allowed. Yeah. And also like, why does anyone have to brag about anything that they do? What if these people just love to play? For instance, now that, you know, having lived in Los Angeles and a lot of my friends were directors and producers and actors and even people behind the scenes that like you only see their names in credits and only sometimes a lot of the people that make movies and TV shows, they play. Uh, you can see it. We have one of the people who's working on our Kickstarter or on our book for Kickstarter and doing a side quest is Mitch Iverson. And he was one of the writers on uh, Voltron. He actually has a Dungeons and Dragons, uh, not a whole episode, but they, they use minis and it's very Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it's very cool. And also he's, I think like he worked on the Dota cartoon that's on Netflix mm -hmm. right now. And so here are people You've got um, Javier Grillo Marswash, who's the executive producer, I believe, of The Dark Crystal. And he's a good friend of mine. He's been in Celebrity Charity 20 playing Dungeons and Dragons, you know, and the, the other writers, they also play Dungeons and Dragons. You've got uh, the producer of Transformers. His whole company is called Paladin Entertainment. He loves Dungeons and Dragons. And so what people don't see is that people, every, like, Tons of people play D&D. I taught J.J. Abrams' son how to play Dungeons and Dragons. You know, so it's like, and that's only because he didn't want to teach him and he thought it would be good for his son to learn from someone else. And so it's just one of those things where not everyone talks about it because it's a passion of theirs. It's a hobby and it's okay. And when people find out that more people are playing, honestly, and I'm not telling people what to do, but I think... I know that I'm very excited to find out that more people are playing. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love the fact that more people are playing. Um, um, just, yeah. I mean, why not? I, I always thought it was the greatest hobby in the world. So, uh, you know, you're right. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I always wanted as many people to play as possible, but, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And, um, I think even before I started doing this podcast, I didn't realize how many people in Hollywood actually played, uh, Dungeons and Dragons or other tabletop role playing games because I've interviewed, say, Robert Hewitt Wolf on the podcast. Um, he was uh, executive producer on Elementary most recently, but some uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine back in the day. Uh, he was a producer on that show. Um, he grew up playing RuneQuest, right? So, I mean, you know, uh, he even slipped uh, some names of his characters into the uh, Andromeda oh. TV series. Oh, that's, <laughs> so, that's cool. Yeah, very cool. So, uh, um, that was. I, I don't know. It was just for me, like I said, there were certain times when I didn't believe anybody played except for me. And, uh, you know, so it is always fantastic when I hear people play, you know, that people play. So I, I love the fact that more people are playing and that um, it is uh, it is OK for everybody to play. And I, I just want to everybody to enjoy tabletop role playing games. Um, as much as I do, which is quite a bit, because I talk about it all day, <laughs> pretty much every day. <laughs> so. you do. It's, it's so funny when people call it a hobby. I'm like, it is a life. What do you mean? Yeah. You literally <laughs> have a tattooed our... on my throat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> RPGs and gaming is our life. Yeah. It's like yeah. So yeah yeah. No. yeah yeah that is that is absolutely true and uh and uh, i i've went through a similar thing be, being like this is my hobby this is what i like to do and then i've turned it into my life because i couldn't i couldn't stop <laughs> i yeah. couldn't stop yeah absolutely well now um let's kind of jump into um something that you guys have been working on right now and that is on kickstarter right now it is called sirens Battle of the Bards. Why don't Satine? Why don't you just give us kind of the overview, and then we'll dive in on some aspects here. Sure. Uh, Thebardbook.com is where you can go to uh, click to go to 
Sirens Battle of the Bards. It's a fifth edition campaign and setting set in the city of Salvata, a city made by artists for artists and for their friends. So uh, yeah, we've created this adventure. It's 20 adventures. It's 10 new bardic subclasses, countless, um, <laughs> <laughs> countless uh, magic items and mechanics for bringing your group together to play with one another versus playing next to one another. So we've taken elements from Game Master tips that I had on Geek and Sundry and, um, you know, a lot of the history and experiences that we've had over the quarantine times and really put them into a book to up to show people that they can be a hero. There can be a lot of darkness in your world and how to overcome that and, and really kind of like make a story that both takes you up in that heroic way to the light, but also can be really fun and dangerous and has a lot of really, really interesting combat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, nice, nice. Uh, why Bards? Well, um, I've had a live stream for the last four years, started on the Dungeons and Dragons Twitch. And yeah, it's called Sirens. And it used to be called Sirens of the Realms. And then I've taken it under my own wing and it's moved over to my own Twitch channel. And yeah, it, I... I've been playing D&D for a long time. I, I'm, I love Eberron. I love the magic of it. And the only, as a dungeon master, the only way I've really gotten to experience that like very Sharn type of colorfulness in my gaming was with bards. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to have an all-girl bard band who's on tour through the realms. That way I can learn about the world and also they can learn about the world. And it's just a really good cool thing to do i got to bring in my character from when i was 12 uh vlania who's the band manager and she kind of sends them out on adventures it's a little charlie's angels but it's also a little bit of gem and she-ra put in because they have to save the world from this evil nefarious group called the emerald cabal and so that's that way bards it actually evolved past an all-girl group because i have a lot of friends and one of my best friends is jason charles miller the musician and voice actor and so he was like, I want to play. And like, sure, of course. Yes, please come join our team. So he's our siren bro. And they're all bards or bard multi-class. And it is the most colorful, playful group I've ever played with. They're unique. We craft um, because they're bards and they really are good at role playing. They've all developed these beautiful characters. And so you've taken sirens from that live stream. And we're like, okay. How do we put those elements into a book for other people to play? We want to give you a campaign to play. And how do you make it different than the 5,000 campaigns that are out there to play in, right? So we created um, a city of bards and you can either pick a subclass or you can be any class at all and create a band. So why bards? Well, because sirens. But why sirens battle the bards? Because cooperation. Uh, and one of the things that we, we were really looking um, looking forward to doing, so um, Batheos and Studio's last book was a warlock book. It was called The Red Opera. And it was set in a city called Yonkath in the Shadelands. Uh, it's very dark and gloomy. What you think for warlocks and patrons and a lot of, you know, fey creatures and a very kind of spooky, warlocky atmosphere. Um, and to have a setting um, usually surrounding a city um, that is predominantly either controlled or created by a particular class um, really gives that location a specific feeling. And so you don't have to be a warlock to play in Yonkoth at the Red Opera, nor do you have to be a bard to play in Selvata. Um, but it, it's, it, we, these classes are so iconic um, to have a setting that's dedicated where you just these these people kind of flock together it really sets the tone of that location and you can then build a campaign that uses elements of those things and it's a great way to pick up even if people want a temporary subclass during that experience to try something new for a previously existing character or party um, or roll up a new character that is a bard but you don't have to be and so from a, a storytelling perspective it's really great to actually look at gaming through a particular lens um, even in some cases if you want to cause havoc in that city so uh, within Yonkoth 
our kind of um, underground uh, criminal element are actually clerics because they just hate warlocks. <laughs> they hate fiends and they hate, you know, hate patrons, great old ones and, and, and all the rest. And so they want to burn the city to the ground and they're a bunch of warlocks, or excuse me, a bunch of clerics. You don't think of a cleric as, you know, something like that. Um, and so here in, in, um, uh, in Siren's Battle of the Bards, we actually have some, some druids um, and they themselves uh, operate not so much as criminal underground, but kind of are fueling this resistance of other bards as well to try and kind of topple some of the, the hierarchy that's prevalent in the city, some of the corruption that they're seeing. And so it's just a, it's a fun way of being able to, to weave a, a story in a unique way that you can't really get otherwise. Yeah. No, that sounds fantastic. Um, it is kind of funny. I I am just for the first time multiclassing my character to be a bard. Uh, this is the oh, first well, time I've ever touched yeah. on bard, um, which is a lot of fun. Um, so I this is kind of my first experience. So I'm I, I'm finding you know uh, reading about uh, sirens. I was finding that very interesting because uh, um, it, at first I didn't think I would like the bard, but my character kind of fit, and you know I had the charisma there, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to multiclass into bard, and it and it's working. Um, uh, he is actually, uh, it's a post-apocalyptic kind of fantasy. So he's like a, he's like a giant a gorilla, like Planet of the Apes kind of thing. So he's right. a fighter, but now he is multi-classing into Bard. Um, and it worked out way better than I thought. So uh, that is just really fascinating. But now you have added um, 10 new Bard subclasses. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And we're yeah. really excited for seeing like what you're explaining. Yeah, to your us. character would actually probably be a perfect fit for summer. So yeah. Right. So we, you know, there's your bard with a high charisma, or that's a charisma based bard, but we're actually looking and developing um strength based bards, dex, intelligence, wisdom, so that you can bring in your character with whatever other class and also take a subclass that doesn't cost you any extra abilities right so you don't have to worry okay i have to be a charisma and a strength well what if you had a really high strength and you wanted to be a bard like we don't want you to to get negated uh, because of that mm -hmm. so yeah we we want to create something that amplifies what you're already doing on top of yes we we will have a lot of charisma based um bard subclasses but uh there's there's those kind of that way to look at what we're doing and then the other way which is um looking at what artists are artists are communicators and they're also evokers of emotion right master communicators and the emotion you look at a piece of art and it's like uplifting or repelling so um we are also breaking it down to introverted bards and extroverted bards some bards want to sing right uh some bards want to be in front and perform others are like illustrators or painters or sculptors or tattoo artists or bar well bartenders I think like it's kind of performing mm -hmm. you know or bodybuilders or gymnasts and so it's like um, what what are ways like maybe I'm a gymnast but I don't want to speak because that's I'm a little shy but I communicate with my body so this is a really cool way to have a deck space bar that doesn't need verbal components because that is how they communicate. So we're leaning into stuff like that as well. So uh, the two that we have uh, that we have named so far, because the naming is very complex, uh, is the College of Anatomy. It's your deck space bard, your bodybuilder, your acrobat. Um, you've got your uh, intelligence based bard, and that is the uh, the College of Geometry, sacred geometry. You've got your architect people who see the, the art and beauty in math. And um, that's very valuable. We, we really want to make sure everyone feels that they're represented in a way. So rather than saying we have a tattoo bard, we have an architect bard, it's College of Geometry. And if you go to this college, these are some of the things that you could be as that kind of bard. I went to art school. That's kind of how that works. Not everyone's a sculptor that, that majored in sculpture. Yeah, so so leaning into kind of the the, the 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 colleges themselves, where you could kind of pick how you want that character to play out and really customize it for you. Particularly if you're doing it as a subclass, or if you already have several levels in something else, how can you augment your current character uh, to really lean into you know some additional new storytelling um, you know options and some you know pretty cool combat options too to make it really unique um, for you know our, our 
you know, epic encounters. Yeah, we're excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. And the Kickstarter is going on right now, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah live, live, live right now. We we just uh, just unlocked um, a new new stretch goal, and we got a couple more to go. So yeah, yeah. we're super excited. It started on April twenty second, and it ends on my birthday, May twenty second. So that, of course, is going to be a big event, and it's uh, we we're writing an epic for that. Very specifically, is seven different groups playing, uh, and they're all apart working together to overcome an obstacle. And we uh, yeah, so that the last day of the Kickstarter is May twenty second. Okay, great. And where can people uh, find the Kickstarter? At thebardbook.com. Yeah, we, we make it we make make it easy for folks. Thebardbook.com. <laughs> thebardbook.com. All right. And I will be sure to put that link in the show notes for this episode at dicegeeks.com. So anybody who is listening can head over there uh, right now and check out uh, thebardbook.com and see Siren's Battle of the Bards. Now, you know, guys, I am sitting here with uh, Satine Phoenix and Jameson Stone, and I'm just wondering, when do I get my action movie name? Because I'm just like, I'm just like some guy named Matt. And, uh, but so, um, so maybe I could make up something, maybe like uh, Jericho Jones or something like that. You like that one? Okay. Maybe I can go with that one. But, uh, but, you know, Satine and Jameson, I I thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Um, It was really fascinating to hear kind of where you came, came from uh, with your gaming experience and to hear about sirens, which sounds really awesome. And I would encourage everybody to check it out some amazing visuals and graphics uh, uh, in your intro video in your trailer on Kickstarter some amazing stuff there so I thank you guys so much for being on the podcast today thank you yeah thank you all right there you have it guys Oh my goodness, it was such a pleasure to talk to Satine and Jameson today. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Now, as I mentioned, I have placed links in the show notes for this episode at DiceGeeks.com to their Kickstarter, Sirens Battle of the Bards. I really encourage you to check it out. All right, guys, if you want some free stuff, head over to DiceGeeks.com slash free. You'll get 10 free dungeon maps. You'll never miss an episode of this show. And each and every Friday, you'll get an email update from me letting you know what is going on here at Dice Geeks. Now, guys, if you really enjoy this show, I could really use your help. If you could like, rate, subscribe, or review this podcast wherever you are listening today, That would help the show immensely. Some of those things only take just a couple of seconds. You can do them super fast, and they would be a great help for me and to the show. Also, if you are in a position to support the show financially, you can go to patreon.com slash dice geeks and learn how to support the show financially there. I would greatly appreciate it. Now, as always, guys, I thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. And until next Wednesday... Keep gaming.